as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. Hey everybody, so uh, I'm a little under the weather now. I thought I was getting better, but turns out I'm not getting better. Now I have bronchitis. Uh, so my voice sounds a little funny. Uh, sorry about that. Just bear with me. Uh, today is a good chapter. I say that all the time. These gospel chapters are so good. Um, Jesus is so good. And the stories about him are so rich and so, so valuable. So um, stick with us today, despite the terrible sounding voice. And uh, we're going to get through John chapter 9. Let's pray. God, thanks for being with us. Um, Lord, I, I, I thank you for the ways that you are with us each day, your presence in our lives. Um, thank you for the way you, you pick us up and comfort us when we fall. Lord, I pray that we, um, we hear from you today and we learn you more as we uh, see the life of Jesus played out in these pages, as we see the, the heart and the compassion and the mission uh, that the God-man Jesus had on this earth. <sighs> yeah, we, we give you this time, Lord. We, um, we do this to be faithful in our, in our daily walk, and we ask you to honor that and to uh, help us to grow in you and be transformed uh, by your Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers also twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and clothed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and were slapping his face. Pilate went outside again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you, f to let you know I find no grounds for charging him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the temple servants saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate responded, Take him and crucify him yourselves, since I find no grounds for charging him. We have a law, the Jews replied to him, and according to the law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard the statement, he was more afraid than ever. He went back into the headquarters and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus did not give him an answer. So Pilate said to him, Do you ref refuse to speak to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? You would have no authority over me at all, Jesus answered him, if it hadn't been given to you from above. This is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. From that moment, Pilate kept trying to release him. But the Jews shouted, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Anyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Then Pilate heard these words. He brought Jesus outside. He sat down on the judge's seat in a place called the Stone Pavement, but an Aramaic Gabbatha. It was the preparation day for the Passover, and it was about noon. Then he told the Jews, Here is your king. They shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Should I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Then he handed him over to be crucified. Then they took Jesus away. Carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a sign made and put on the cross. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Don't write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier. They also took the tunic, which was seamless, 
woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my clothes among themselves, and they cast lots for my clothing. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies to remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a special day. They requested that Pilate have men's legs broken and that their bodies be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other one who had been crucified with him. When they came to Jesus, they did not break his legs, since they saw that he was already dead. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this was testified, has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows he is telling the truth. For these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Also, another scripture says, they will look at the one they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might remove Jesus' body. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took his body away. Nicodemus, who had previously come to him that night, also came bringing a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. They took Jesus' body and wrapped it in linen cloths, with the fragrant spices according to the burial custom of the Jews. There was a garden in the place where he was crucified. A new tomb was in the garden. No one had yet been placed in it. They placed Jesus there because of the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby. Okay, so the day is April 3rd, A.D. 33, and Jesus' execution time has finally come. Despite Pilate's personal conviction that Jesus is actually innocent here, he yields to the unrelenting cries of the Jewish leaders, and after various attempts to dissuade the opposition, he hands Jesus over to be crucified. John's account here is, uh, is brief, but clear. Jesus carried his own cross to the place of the skull where he was crucified with two others. He entrusts the care of his mother to the disciple which he loved, which most believe is John. Various things happen in this chapter that John wants us to see are the fulfillment of prophecy of Old Testament scripture, and he points those out to us. The biblical authors do that so that we see uh, the scripture was written centuries before and it actually pointed to these very events. When we find evidence for these things in history and science, uh, it just builds our confidence. Speaking of evidence, um, let me mention a few things. I I, I started by saying that the date was uh, the 3rd of April, A.D. 33. If you're curious about that date, I'll leave a link to a paper uh, in the description by uh, Humphreys and Waddington. And, and they, they show us how they use uh, scientific evidence to deduce the best, most likely date here. Um, let me just say that there are many today that are convinced that science has disproven the Bible, but actually that's far from true. 
Uh, in this case, we have astronomy and history helping to show us uh, what the actual dates are for this crucifixion. This is an example of theology and science working in tandem. Uh, feel free to read the article for a uh, pretty good discussion on this. It's a scholarly level article, um, so uh, don't be discouraged if, uh, if you don't understand all of it at the first time through. Now, since I'm talking about the reliability of the text, uh, I have to point out one other thing. In the opening verses of chapter 19, we're told that Jesus has a purple garment put around him. Well, a few months ago, we read Matthew's gospel, and in Matthew's parallel, it's described as a scarlet garment. Oh no, these biblical authors didn't know what they're talking about. We've debunked the whole Bible because obviously it can't be scarlet and purple. Um, well, that's actually the type of things people do. They look at these things and say there's a discrepancy and, uh, and they use it as an excuse to distrust the Bible. I wanna help you trust the Bible. Um, I want to bring you to a place each day where you're growing in faith and confidence in God's word. The, the more I study the Bible, the more I actually trust it. And the deeper I get into it and the more I learn about it, the more trust and faith I have. Uh, so wh when I looked into this issue, um, yes, one says purple, one says red, um, but purple dye was very expensive. It was uh, acquired actually from shellfish, so it was really expensive. And uh, perhaps the garments were intended to be purple uh, to denote royalty. That was a color for royalty. Um, and this would have been the guard's outer robes, probably most likely in this situation. Uh, but maybe they only used a little bit of purple dye, and maybe they used some more red dye, which was cheaper and more readily available. Uh, so it's entirely possible that to some eyes it looked red and to others it looked purple. So uh, let's try not to get wrapped up, uh, wrapped around the axle with these types of things. Uh, we believe that the Bible is the word of God, but the way God has chosen to give us this word is through human authors, and each book has its own human element. Uh, if, if you've been taught in your life that the Bible was kind of like a, a digital download from God to man, where uh, God took over the man and just uh, wrote, wrote the text out, that's actually not the way it happened. We, we see the author's personalities and styles come through very clearly, but we also know that God was involved in every step of the way and he ensured that the text was uh, exactly how he wanted it to be with the author's personalities and styles and even quirks all intact. Okay, getting back to the narrative here. Uh, Jesus has willingly brought himself to a place where he's subject to the most painful torture imaginable. <sighs> Witnesses of beatings like we see here have noted that you could often see bones and entrails exposed of the victims. Jesus submitted himself to that intentionally to complete his mission. He went through hell on this earth to deliver on his promise of, of hope and, and peace for, for eternity for those who follow him. This story, um, this story should leave us humbled today and and wanting to worship and love this king all the more. Take some time to sit with that today. And we will see you all tomorrow.